I'm starting from the earliest image that I have, which is um, right out of undergraduate school. I began as a figurative artist, mostly painting still lifes. And when I moved to New York after graduating the Kansas City Art Institute, I set up a still life and I did a triptych, which I thought of as a triptych, which was three paintings. Uh, I only have this one image, but three paintings of the still life, so real quick. Um, I went to Yale University graduate school for two years, and after I got out from um, school, I had an apartment on 15th Street, and I, again, I, I focused on my process because I was right out of school, and for me what was important was to figure out how to work on my own. And so I set up a still life, and I would do studies from the still life, and then I began to invent from the still life. So we'll go through these quickly, because it's like a million years ago. Uh, what is it, 1978. So anyway, so these were large for me. I don't know what this was, five feet by five feet, but you can see how I'm inventing from the still life. And I would do portraits of my objects, too. I would set up different different ways of working. That's how I would work. I'd work on different things basically to stay in the studio because I couldn't work on one thing that long. I also began these, um, I began looking at painters, which I did in school too, but I primarily was looking at Vuillard and Bonnard, and I did paintings after Vuillard and Bonnard, which were basically female figures in interior spaces. And that's how I worked, and I just kept working that way. And then in 19, I did these paper pieces also, and they were somewhat automatic in that I would finish them in one sitting, and I would do hundreds of them, and I would only get a few that I liked, and it would be oil on paper, again, from the still lifes. And these became very important to me because I felt like in some ways they were the most interesting thing I was doing. In, um, let's see, it's hard for me to remember all this. 1982, I went to Bloomington, Indiana where um, I was hired to teach painting and drawing. And um, again, I just continued the same way I was working. I set up a still life, which I would do these more what I would call, I wouldn't call them realistic, but I was working from the sources. And then um, I would also invent paintings. But the key shift here, I'm trying to make emphasis on the shifts, is that um, I started studying Matisse's Red Room because when I was in graduate school, Al Held was one of my teachers. And he said to me, this is the most important painting ever painted in the 20th century, which is like it. I thought, are you out of your mind? But anyway, he told me, he said, you have to study it. And of course, being kind of a little belligerent, even though I, I really liked him and worked with him, I just didn't study it. But when I got to Bloomington, I did start to look at it. And I looked really hard at it. And I would do paintings after it, and I'd do drawings of it. And I began a series of paintings. I taught in Bloomington, I can't remember, four years, I think, where I would have the color would be the key character that I was dealing with. So I would do a red painting, a blue painting, a green painting, and I would try to see how I could shift this, where the color was in space or the sensation of the color. So this is, again, the still life that I'm looking at. And this was um, my yellow painting. Uh, what inspired this, I actually learned a lot from this painting. I'm, the images are extremely yellow in, in this, in whatever, tonight. They're not quite this yellow. Was, um, I, it was my first real teaching job, and all my students would use yellow as light. And um, I thought, there's no light in this yellow. So I decided that I had to do a yellow painting. And I learned that yellow is not particularly light. So anyway. That was my yellow painting. And this is another painting. And what I did in this painting, um, again, it's the still life sort of looking out the window. I'm always inventing from the source. But I saw how fractured my marks were as I was, you know, and I thought they were the most interesting thing in the paintings, and they were the most interesting thing back in the paper painting. 
This is a portrait of the, my plant stand that I had. I thought of it as a portrait. I want to go quickly through these because it's so old. But anyway, what I was saying about the, um, let's go back to this. When I looked at my work, the paper paintings and this painting, I kept wondering why all these little fractured marks, because that's not what I was seeing. And um, I began to look at painters and artists that were more Eastern, because I felt, well, maybe there's something about me that's more Eastern in sensibility. So I looked a lot at Chagall, and I looked a lot at Japanese prints. And by looking at painters and trying to learn from them, it was very freeing, because then I, I remember specifically, this was I thought of as I, I got married in Bloomington, and I thought of this painting was influenced by Chagall, I started to move forms through legs, and I didn't have to see things as separately. So this was kind of an important painting, and it was an invented painting. And these, I uh, started doing the paper paintings larger, and I started doing more of them. Um, I had a rolling wall with a dowel on the top, and I would pull the paper down, gesso it, and then do these paintings that, again, I didn't really edit. I didn't change things. So they were responses to the still lifes that I was looking at. And I think possibly they were the most interesting thing that I was doing. So here's an example of three. So this is a, another shift. I'm trying to make the talk sort of an emphasis on my shifts. Um, went to New Haven in um, Oh boy, I don't remember. 1986, maybe. Um, my former husband was in school, and I was teaching part time. And what I did was I tried to do large paintings after my paper paintings. So what the way I would keep them looking like my paper paintings is I would white out, which I learned from Matisse, so that they looked fresh. The other key thing here is I started drawing from my paintings and I would draw very differently. I began to draw differently than I had learned how to draw. I had learned how to draw big planes, and I realized when I drew from my own paintings, I'd make these little dots and dashes, and it slowed me down, and it made me learn that I had to not only uh, have different imagery, I had to make the paintings differently. They had to be built differently. I don't know if that's a clear idea, but anyway. So that, these are examples of, these are the largest paintings I ever did. I don't know what they are, eight feet tall by six feet. The other one's the biggest painting. I did three of these. Um, anyway, I took this shape from a Japanese uh, print. This is sort of a still life. But again, it's fairly large for me. And then after uh, two years in New Haven, uh, my former husband and I moved to New York, and I just continued working the way I had been working, except they were, I worked large, and I just have one example from this. I took the overall construction of this painting from a Sienese painting, but, the, and I worked, again, oh, look how dirty these slides are, but anyway, um, again, on canvas, but in the spirit of the paper paintings where I would white out in order to keep it fresh. and um, So this is an example of that. The big shift happens, um, I think, the biggest shift I, for me was I got a job at, in, at American University. And um, my marriage started breaking up, I guess, around 1991. I don't know, I was commuting. 89 to 93, so maybe my marriage is breaking up in 92, I don't know. And I really got very depressed. And I started painting these small, what I called my suitcase period, because I kept thinking, I'm going to leave this town. This is DC. I can't stand it. I'm out of here. It was my suitcase period, which lasted until whatever like 20 years, I don't know. But anyway, um, 
But the, it, was it was interesting because I had always compartmentalized my process. I do this, the women in the studio, I do my paper paintings, I do the large still lifes, I do study of the still lifes, I do the invented paintings. This period, the only thing I cared about was just painting. Whatever it took, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't analyzing, I was just whatever I could do. And so the paintings were small, and I felt they were somber and intimate, and these are the early ones, early 90s, and they just kept evolving. The, the, um, they were non-objective, because that's all I could do, and I wasn't looking at the still life anymore. As my friend said, I was standing up and chewing gum. I mean, I just as long as I could paint, it didn't matter to me what I was painting. And, um, but I thought of them as sort of like the forms hidden inside the skin of the paint. And so for me, even though they're simple, abstract, somewhat geometric, I thought that, saw them as bodies. And as I did them, I, I, I can't remember if it's like 96, approximately 1996, I started doing paintings that felt as though things were inside a veil space that forms were hidden inside the surface of the canvas. And I thought they were very quiet still and very, um, I guess the, a friend of mine said they were very silent paintings. Um, 1995, right, okay. So 1995, um, I'm making these light, they were all, for two years, they were all this light greenish, kind of paintings where you could hardly see the images. You could see them, but you could hardly see them. Um, and I was chair in 1995. And the strangest thing happened to me was I kept trying to make these paintings. And I couldn't for like, I don't remember how long it was, six months, eight months, a year, I don't remember. But every day I'd go into the studio and I'd go, if I can't find the form, because I work from moving the paint around and trying to find the form, I don't look at anything, um, I'm gonna quit. I kept saying, next time I'm gonna quit. This is it, I can't take it anymore. And <laughs> it just kept going. It was amazing that I stayed with it because it was like so unpleasant. I couldn't find anything for almost a year. And I have nothing from that year. January 1996, my mother passed away, and I still was painting. You know, I'm always in the studio, and I came back from, she was living in Florida, and it was really amazing. It was almost like when um, my marriage was breaking up. I just started painting, and the whole color shifted. And I realized I couldn't make those paintings because I kept starting with that light palette, and I could not make paint, I mean, I just couldn't even do them, I couldn't do them now. Um, and the whole, the palette just changed to these dark red paintings. Again, they're kind of small, like 20 inches by whatever, 16 inches or something, maybe a little bit bigger they got. And as I just, I just did those paintings and slowly I felt working non-objectively, these kind of forms began to emerge that felt more like bodies. And during this time and still today, I basically work on one painting at a time. And as a release, I draw. And very often when I'm drawing, this not specifically, I'm looking at old masters and trying to learn from them. And um, this is not specifically looking at anything but um, I'm very inf beginning to be very influenced by Picasso. This is a study from um, Bellini. Anybody that has any questions, just speak up, so, even while I'm talking. This is a drawing that I did from my painting. Uh, my paintings were becoming, becoming more linear, so I started to draw from them. To, I'm always trying to figure stuff out, less so than I used to, but I sort of try and always figure something out. But So these sort of mound-like forms that were very built very linearly um, started to evolve, and I started to think about them as heads. 
sometimes, or mo I'd say all the time, not sometimes, I have to, I'm looking for the form. It's a strange way of working. I'm kind of looking to try to figure out what my painting is. And I have to name it in order to build it. I have to sort of see something there. So even if it's just a mound, but I have to feel like it's something real. So these heads started to emerge for me. Um, just examples of these. Uh, you can see that's a head and that's a head. Okay, let's go back. So that's a head. I know that was done in 2002, so we have that date. Um, as I said before, in my studio, I'm always drawing from reproductions and drawing in the museums, which I'm sure we all do, um, coming from similar tradition. I did go to the studio school for a semester and worked with Leland Bell. I started drawing from this Leonardo, and it blew me away because the legs do not add up. So, you know, figure could be those legs or these legs or who belongs to these legs and also that kind of horizontal in the middle but granted it's a reproduction but I could not figure out what was going on. So I was looking at that and I was really as I said before I was looking a lot at Picasso and um, I began to see for example where the edge of his arm becomes the edge of the shape behind it and the arm, and one thing affects another and bends the other. The arm bends that form, that then bends the arm form. And I really started to look really hard at Picasso. And I do have one little recommendation. I'm not teaching, but I, I do think it's a good, good thing that I do. If you love an artist, it's really great to look at their influences because you sort of get to understand them more deeply. So I had this passion for Picasso, and so I felt like I gotta go back and see who he loved, or I thought he loved, or for his forms reminded me of. So I looked a lot at Ang, and you can see those crazy, that crazy, I had a pointer, I'd point, that shoulder and that back arm, they're basically on the, on the same diagonal. And then if you isolate the skirt, there's nothing under there. It's like, it's so unconvincing as a volume in terms of the human form. It's just draping over. Uh, so anyway, I would draw. And I started to look at Piero a lot, sort of the crazy diagonal figure. And anyway, again, this is so similar to me as the Picasso. If you look at that gigantic arm and the way it's kind of hooking up with that red shape and becoming part of the castle and then the arm turns the castle anyway. So it was really, I would draw from this and look where it hits him, it's nuts. Anyway, but it was very freeing. Every time I learn a little more, I feel like it's freeing. So I began, the figures started coming out more and more and they, I would look for big forms and, and and it didn't matter if legs would be shared by the figures. So these are the early, whatever, uh, 2004, I don't know. I actually don't know the dates of these, but these are just a group that I did uh, where you can see I'm looking for the big shape and there are suggestions of figures. And you can also see how much of a cubist I am. So. Then basically the importance of one thing affecting another and one thing turning into another. And they all come from trying to find the form. And I think what moves the paintings is I keep drawing from old masters and that I think is the biggest shift, or causes the biggest shift in my work. Yeah, good. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship to the material? Uh, Would you please wait for the mic? Here you go. Oh.
Could you please talk a little bit about your relationship to paint and the paint. viscosity and impasto and yeah, how now, that? Yeah, Th this, for a very long period, I had very thick paint. And um, I liked it, I actually missed that surface. I don't have it anymore. And I would not scrape out so the paint would get built up. But I'm not a will willful painter. I never go for anything. I don't say, I'm going to paint a thick painting, or uh, I love paint, so it's going to be part of my image. I'm always like looking for the form. I'm looking for the form to convince me that it's real. And um, so the, these were very built up paintings. They're done over a long period of time. But I don't go for the uh, surface for the surface sake. I feel like they're working with the forms. And so I accepted it as complete. So in a way, um, I don't know, that's a hard question for me to answer because it's clear that they're very thickly painted. So, and I, I like those surfaces. As a matter of fact, as I said, I'm in a very strange surface now. So we'll see, but these were, is that an okay answer? Oh, any, any answer is okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's an open question. Yeah, okay. So just examples of my drawings. Again, I don't know what this is from, but uh, I see them as doodles. I think of them as releases and as doodles, and they're just, just do them. And they're, I, I don't, I don't worry pen. about, that's ballpoint. I have a lot in ballpoint pen. I like ballpoint pen, although it might not last very long. But you, you can see how, um, I guess, how influenced I am by, well, m not as much in this one, not maybe the last. Well, Crosshatcher, too, I've always. I was wondering, I'm not sure if this is from that Leonardo or not. I don't know. This, you can see how influenced I am by Picasso. You know, so I'm trying to be my, but it's not from a Picasso just started moving the lines. Okay, so I don't really remember what year, but we're all looking. That I'm gonna stop at 2014. So we're looking between 2004 and 2014. And they're all thickly painted. And um, I guess I feel like a painting is finished when it feels real. And that's a strange thing to say because they're not real, but there's something about them. And, and when I'm looking at this period, those 10 years, I'm looking at Picasso, but I'm looking at Renaissance. I really never looked at Renaissance painting that much before this period, 2002, whatever. And I'm looking at Greek sculpture and uh, medieval sculpture. And I'm um, liking that the figures had weight. Maybe that's part of the surface weight, and that they were on the edge of the canvas. So they felt sculptural to me. And I like the fact that it was sort of a head, but not a head. It was a figure inside a head. But it's the movement and the shape configuration that I guess was really driving the paintings. Boy, the yellow is whacked out. That is not so yellow. The yellow seems to be the, anyway, doesn't matter. This is very, um, not really accurate color, but. Um, all right, enough of these. Do I have my little, that's a small one. This painting, slightly different. I'm going from one grieving thing to another, but that's important for me. My brother died in 2008, and um, it was a tough time, and I wanted to do a mourning painting. And the only, as I said, I'm not very willful. I just start moving color shapes around the canvas. But in this painting, I wanted to do a white painting, because I thought that that was the color of grieving. So around this time, I feel like this sort of family groups were kind of in the back of my head in terms of subject matter. But there's really, 2012, I do remember the date on that one. Wow, the color is really off, folks. But it's okay. Sort of another figure becoming an animal and 
just, and I always felt as the area around the figuration was holding the figures. I don't really feel that way. Uh, this is where I wanted to stop because 2014, I felt like the um, forms were becoming not as sculptural. They were more elusive, ephemeral, and again, I didn't will it, but I saw it in the work. Like early on when I said I saw that I was a Byzantine, I saw that I was Eastern, I started to look at Chagall. So I started about 2014, but it's not categorical because I'm looking at these artists earlier too, but I started looking more at Baroque painters. Um, and I started looking at, um, I don't know, Fragonard, and I started looking at Watteau, and anyway, so I started looking at some different artists. This is, reminds me a little bit of a Pieta. <laughs> and they're just becoming, this is from my 2015 show. Then in this size, I'm not giving the sizes, but this is about, I don't know, four feet by three feet, maybe 50 inches, 52 inches by whatever, 40 inches. This is one that I was particularly fond of from my 2015 show. And as I said, you know, the more I learn, the freer I feel, feel I am to do things. Um, so. I also, when, when I finish a painting, um, sometimes I look at them and I go, who are these people? But I, also, <laughs> but I also like the fact, and this is not gonna be articulated that well, but that there's like an implied psychological narrative, but there isn't. But I like the fact that it feels that way. So that's part of, if I have to make a list of criteria for when painting feels complete, that's part of it. But it's mostly about trying to make space, trying to make things work, trying to convince myself that my world is real. Well, this is all from 2015. And examples, this is, this, is, this is my most recent work. So we're looking at 2016 to now. And again, same old thing. The drawings are released. The only thing that I have to say that's different about the drawings is um, I think all of us probably, and that's not fair to say, but a lot of us who come from studio school tradition, we're always trying to get the whole thing to work, right? I mean, we have to. But in my drawings, I work, I said, I'm just gonna work the parts. So I doodle, you know, I do a, a Michelangelo over here, my landscape out the window, something invented. It looks like Uccello is over here. I don't know what's over here. And they're just like collections, almost like a blackboard. I'm just moving around. And the scale of the figures are smaller. Uh, again, that's from uh, Goya. I'm looking a lot at Goya in the last four years. Although, unfortunately, you can't really see that I'm looking at him, but I really have been looking at him a lot. That's a landscape out my window, invented things. Is that the same? No, okay. That's again a Corot, uh, Corbet invention. But it's like, I'm not worried about the whole. I'm just, this is my studio with invented stuff in it. And this is a crazy drawing ballpoint pen. Wow, oh, these are terrible slides. Anyway, so Watteau. I'm looking a lot at Watteau, just different influences. Just the way, it's like the space is not this to this, which may be what my earlier, even though I tried to kind of pull things, I think earlier from let's say 202 to whatever, 214, you know, it's a little bit more back and forth, but I think it's more like Like if you look at that black shape, it's not front to back. Oh man, so great. Look at that insane 
well, these are slides, but that black shape that really should be a hole, but it's not a hole, and how the whole left side pulls away from the form. Anyway, just, you know, just different influences that changed my work. I guess I've always looked at Balthus. He helps me see kind of how to construct the whole rectangle. Corbet, although I'm looking more at Corbet landscapes than this particular, although this is at Smith, so that's near where I live. So I have drawn from this one. This is 2016. What? Smith College? Yeah. This is uh, 2016. Maybe it'll be in my show. I'm not sure. So it's the earlier part of the most contemporary work. And as I said before, it doesn't always happen, but it feels like there's a psychological narrative in this to me. So, you know, for me, that kind of works. But I don't have to be. I'm not that, that thing that the, fi the single figure is holding, to me, feels like an instrument, but obviously it's not. And these are just small, that's a small painting. And that's, you can see they're closer to the drawings. I mean, if we go through this lecture again, which I know we all want to do, the paintings sort of run parallel with the drawings. Um, and I'm going to just read. I'll start here, and because we're just we're almost done. And so I wrote this a while ago, and I'll just I think I'll be able to read it, and I'll just kind of go through them. I'll read. All right, here. I believe that art is the language, and I I wrote this in this interview. So you know, if you read the interview, you'll hear it again. I believe that art is the language of the emotion, and that form is the element in art that contains emotion. A person can feel joy and sadness at the same time. In painting, formal contradictions coexist. Like emotion, these contradictions coexist without an argument, without a dialectic. An image may appear flat and volumetric, moving and still, or beautiful and ugly simultaneously. My paintings are an attempt to make this idea visual. In my paintings, movement created by fluctuating space is a metaphor for the mind's fluid movement between consciousness and the unconscious. Painting, for me, is a controlled connection to an inner world. What I have to say is this is kind of my hope and desire. So I'm kind of feel that this is the meaning in my work, but I'm also maybe reading into it. Okay. My painting process is difficult to describe. For me, painting is a journey that often begins in confusion and repetition and ends with what is knowable. For months, am I doing this right? I'm hitting it too hard skipping a few. Did we see all those? All right, whatever. For months, I intuitively weave color, color shapes across the canvas surface. The process of lacing color marks remains constant. What changes as a, is that the color marks begin to appear as images a place, a figure, a group of figures. The painting reveals itself. The fiction on the canvas becomes real, and I work to realize the image. The pressure I put on myself is to make paintings where there is no separation between color and drawing, and where space has no beginning and no end. Nothing can be separate. Everything is part of a continuous space. The image, the skin of the paint, and the color marks are one. And like living things, I want my paintings to appear as masses that cannot be penetrated. Ultimately, my desire is to create painted worlds that reveal my small piece of the truth, my worldview, my heart and mind on the canvas.
Well, they're different. So this is um, 38 inches by 36. This one's a little one, 20 by 16. That's, again, 48 by whatever, 38, something like that. No, not 48, like 44, maybe. That's also a little larger with weensy figures. That's smaller, 20 by 16. So that's it. I don't know how many you want to see again. but So they vary from suitcase size to a little bigger. <laughs> They're all easel size, really. So that's it.